Here are some quotes from one of the 20th century's great philosophers. Uh, he was a man with a sage-like quality who dispensed wisdom with great lucidity and insight. I'm talking about the great Muhammad Ali. His work ranges over a great variety of subjects. On the subject of work and vocation, he had this to offer, reflecting upon his own calling. It's just a job, he said. Grass grows, birds fly, waves pound the sand. I beat people up. As he strode the world stage, he was interested in breaking down racial stereotypes. Uh, every time we watch television, he said, they show us Tarzan and the natives and the jungles. They never told us that these Africans are more intelligent than we are. They speak English, French and African. We can't even speak English good. And then he had this to say as he reflected on his own general approach to life. At home, he said, I am a nice guy, but I don't want the world to know. Humble people, I've found, don't get very far. Now, that's the, uh, the comment I want to focus on. Humble people, I've found, don't get very far. And so he chose to push humility aside, and he's well known for his egocentric statements, isn't he? I am. I mean, you can't get much more um, egotistical than that, can you? I am the greatest. And so he leant into his ego. Now, as the Israelites are poised to enter into the promised land, which is the setting we find them in, in Deuteronomy, they have a choice to make. Do they choose pride or do they choose humility? That's the choice they have as they enter into the promised land. Would they promote themselves as the greatest? Or would they reserve that honour for God alone, the God who rescued them out of slavery? It's a question we're confronted with all the time. Uh, what are you tempted to do when someone pays you a compliment? They might see that you've gained a promotion or they might notice a, a special skill that you have. Maybe they give you a compliment over your, the, the way your garden looks or perhaps some other kind of achievement. The family you've raised, perhaps, might draw compliments from others. Now, when people compliment you, they're not doing something wrong uh, because we, we do make choices and there is an element of our own decision-making and our own hard work in the success that we enjoy. But it's very easy to take that compliment as an indication that we are the ones who've created our success. It's very easy to forget God's role in all that we have enjoyed. How, how easy is it for us to say, well, God has been very gracious in guiding things the way that, that he has guided them, or, or God has, has blessed us with the wonderful things that we're able to enjoy. I mean, I think for some of us, uh, for me, <laughs> those kinds of words don't really roll off the tongue very easily, but it's very easy, isn't it, uh, to accept people's compliments and to allow them to give our, our ego a little bit of a boost. But instead... God calls us to choose humility, to choose two different types of humility because we, in our passage today we, we do see two different types of humility. There's what I call the humility of the wilderness or in your sermon outline, humility of the desert is I think the way I've, I've, uh, I've described it and then there's the humility of the good place, the humility that we're called to show during bountiful times and good times. Um, life goes from one to the other, doesn't it? There are, there are dark moments in life and there are brighter moments in life. Uh, both those situations call for humility from us rather than pride. And um, that humility might look a little different depending on our life situation. So first of all, what do I mean when I speak of the humility of the wilderness, the humility of the desert? We pick things up from verse 2 in Deuteronomy chapter 8 with these words. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that people do not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. 
Moses reminds the Israelites how hungry they were as they tramped through the desert, that arid and parched place, and they were hungry and they were thirsty. And so that led to an air of, of, of testing for them. Uh, they were required to show humility in that situation. The 40-year journey fulfilled a couple of purposes. In the first instance, it was punishment for the Israelites because they refused to go into the land on the first attempt. They didn't show the, the courage and they didn't show the trust in God that they were called to, to show. And so God said, well, this generation will die out in the desert. But not only was it a punishment, it was also a type of desert training, an opportunity for Israel to learn humility. Because when you're in an environment where you're stripped of the basic necessities, where your security is constantly under threat, when you're exposed to hardship, that's a humbling experience because you don't have as much control over the situation as you would like to have. It's humbling because you soon realise you need outside help. You need outside help to, to help you survive, but also outside help to help you approach the situation with a, with a good attitude, with, with, with the right world view. You need help in the moment and help in terms of um, your, the way you conceive your whole situation. And so at the time, in, the time in the wilderness becomes a time of testing for Israel. Are the Israelites humble enough to take God at his word? Or in their pride, will they make their own assessment of the situation and then seek to formulate their own solutions? Do you remember the show Downton Abbey? Um, some of you might still watch it. It's probably on Netflix or, or Stan or, or one of these streaming services. But about 10 years ago, it was on the television and uh, every Sunday night after church, I'd rush home to watch it because I loved it. Complete trash, um, soap opera kind of stuff. But uh, Jazz and I would love watching Downton Abbey on a Sunday night. Do you remember the three daughters of the family? You have Lady Mary, who's a sophisticated older daughter. And then you have Lady Sybil, who's the young tearaway. And then you have poor Edith in the middle. Not as popular as her sisters. But then at one point in, in one series, she finds her man. Or so she thinks. Sir Anthony. And they're due to be wed, but then Sir Anthony has a change of heart. He has other ideas, and so poor Edith suffers the humiliation of being jilted at the altar. Great television. Um, but then came the moment, which I like to think turned the episode from soap opera into reasonable drama, although maybe I'm clutching at straws and trying to excuse my, my watching habits. Uh, Edith's mother is comforting her daughter in her room and she says to Edith, you are being tested. And she's right. That's what the testing of the wilderness is like. When you have your hopes dashed. When you have your security taken away from you. You're being tested. It might seem unfair and it is unfair in some situations. You might not ask for it. But you are forced to endure it and you have to decide how are you going to stand up under that testing? This is the testing of the desert. Are we going to trust in God's promises to sustain us? Or will we turn somewhere else in our response? Are we going to descend into substance abuse? Or are we going to allow unhealthy emotions to grab a hold of us? These are some of the different responses we might show in situations like this. Now, for the Israelites, uh, their temptation was to grumble against God and turn to the worship of other gods. That was how they were going to, that's how they were tempted to respond in that situation. But Moses' plea is that they cling ever more tightly to the promises of God. Because even though they're being tested, God's promise was that he would be with them and he would show them a way through. And he would provide for them, even though there were moments where it seemed that provision might be unlikely. Imagine that God's promises are like a coat that he places over your shoulders. And the desert wind whips up. And remember, deserts aren't always hot. They can sometimes be frigid, can't they? They can sometimes be, be terribly cold. But God has placed a coat over your shoulders, the coat of his promise, the coat of his love, the coat of his guidance, the coat of his provision. 
And when the desert wind whips up, your job is to pull that coat around you, the coat that God has placed upon you, to hold on to it, to not give it up, but to maintain your trust that God has a plan for you. Uh, you don't take the coat off, but you pull it tightly around you. Even if you might think that throwing the coat away might somehow make your, your life easier. One less thing to carry, one less thing to worry about. But Moses is saying to the Israelites, no, you hold on to God's promises and keep your trust in him. Even though the, there will be times of, there have been times of testing as you've wandered through the desert. Moses says there are good reasons not to discard God and his promises to us. Verse 4, verse four your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. God asks us to go through trials, but he promises to sustain us. He does. And then we're told that God leads us to endure trials as an act of love. Verse 5, know in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. It would be unloving for a parent to not allow their child to have some kind of hardship in order for that child to be properly formed. And so it is with God. When he leads us into those situations where we are tested, when hard times come, don't think, I mean, it's very easy to think, oh, what have I done to deserve this? God is punishing me. What have I done? It's very easy to think that, but don't think that. What we can think instead is, well, what does God want me to learn in this situation? How is he training me? What is the path that he wants me to, to, stay, to stay loyal to in this situation? They're the kinds of questions that are helpful to think about because he wants us to exercise faith in him and he will lead us through testing times in order to exercise that faith. So this is the testing in the wilderness. The right response in the testing of the wilderness is to maintain our trust and loyalty to God. Some might think to themselves, well, I'd much rather be spared the trial and have the easier path. In Downton Abbey terms, I'd much rather be Mary than Edith. Thank you very much. Well, we ought to be careful what we, what we wish, what we wish for, what we desire, because... As we read on, we see that the path of plenty has its own temptations. And these are very real temptations which can lead to a pretty terrible outcome, a terrible eternal outcome. If we find ourselves in a time of plenty and we react incorrectly to that time of plenty, uh, then that arouses God's displeasure. So we really do need to be careful about um, the good times. So the second type of humility we're called to pursue is what I call the humility of the good land, the humility that's called forth when times are, are bountiful, in times of plenty. And it really is a good land that the Israelites are about to enter into. Listen to the description from verse 7. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams and pools of water, with springs flowing in the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. Moses is pointing their minds forward to a time when the trial will be over and they'll be in a bountiful land, but the good times come with a particular temptation. Have a listen from verse 10. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws and decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud. And you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. If our humility is meant to be expressed through trust when we're in the wilderness, then once we find ourselves in the land of plenty, then our humility is expressed through praise of God and remembrance of the good things that he's given us. Basically, the humility that's required of us is to recognise God's continued presence and relevance in our lives. 
Wealth brings with it a lot of responsibilities, the responsibility to share it around, for starters. But the first step in using wealth well is to recognise where it comes from. That it comes from the ever-present God who is active and who grants our wealth to, to us. Where does it come from? It comes from him. Verse 17 paints the picture of what happens when we forget that God is the author of our wealth. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. You know the kind of self-talk that's possible. People look around at the lives that they've created for themselves and they can be tempted to think, well, I've done this. I'm awesome. I've played the game and I've won. I recently heard an example of this kind of attitude from a, an area of, of life that I'm not really familiar with, professional football or soccer as it used to be known. Uh, so when we talk about football these days, we're talking about the, the round ball game. Um, and uh, those who are football fans might be shocked. I've never heard of this person until recent weeks. I'm not even sure I can pronounce his name. Jose Mourinho, the uh, Portuguese football manager. Jose Mourinho, uh, a very successful football coach, won a lot of silverware in his time. And uh, 20 years ago, uh, he was the European club champion. He, he led a, a Portuguese side to, to win the European Champions League. And uh, so he was then recruited to move to England and uh, be the manager for Chelsea, a famous club. And in his first ever press conference, he said something extraordinary, which is um, stuck with him for the 20 years that have followed. This is what he said about his club and his role at the club. He said, we have good players, but we have a good manager. Talking about himself. We have a good manager. I am a European champion. I don't mean to be arrogant, he said, but I am a special one. That's what he said. And that's, became his, that's become his nickname in the years since. The special one. <laughs> one that he thought up himself. Now, it's interesting that he justifies his pride based on truth, on facts. He's a champion. He wins silverware. And uh, he went on after that point to win two English championships. So he backed up his talk with, with the right kind of walk. But what that kind of arrogance fails to take into consideration is the other truth that's behind the, the surface level of his human achievements. The other truth is that it is God who has given him his skills. It is God who has given him his opportunities. And so it is God who is the special one. That's the truth that is completely ignored in comments like that. Um, this is what I mean by the, it, the horror of pride. It is so misplaced. It's so wrong. We forget, verse 18, that it is God who gives us the ability to produce wealth. And so this is the temptation that wealth and success brings. If I can go back to the coat metaphor for a moment, when the times of testing come in the wilderness and the weather is hostile, uh, we pull that coat around us, God's promises, God's character, God's care. But when the sun comes out and the, the, the sky lights up and the, the times are good, what are we tempted to do with the coat? We're tempted to take it off, aren't we, and throw it aside. Oh, I don't need that. But the danger then is your shoulders get sunburnt. And so there's a danger in throwing away God's uh, role in our lives. It's foolish to think that we don't need him. Good times are dangerous times for that very reason. There's an old German proverb which says, you need stout legs to hold up under good days. It sounds very German, doesn't it? You need stout legs to hold up under good days. Stout legs to not forget God, but to praise him for all his benefits so freely given to us. In our country at the moment, 
I think we are particularly susceptible to this second kind of temptation. Uh, we're, we're prone to forget the humility that's required while living in a good place. If there's one verse in this passage that describes Australia over the last few decades, it's got to be verse 9. Moses says that the Israelites are about to enter into a land where the rocks are iron and where you can dig copper out of the hills. What does that describe? It describes a mining boom, doesn't it? Isn't that what our country has enjoyed over the last couple of decades? There are plenty of us benefiting from such a boom in this day and age. I think it's very easy for us to feel sorry for ourselves. One of the traps of wealth is that people who are wealthy often don't think they are wealthy. <laughs> It's always someone else, someone who has more riches than you, who, are the, who, are, who is the wealthy person. And so it's easy to think that it's the humility of the desert that we're really called to, 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 to invest in. And we do have real hardships. No one is immune to the humility of the wilderness. But our bank accounts and our assets tell us that it's the humility of the good land that we have to, that we have to practice. So let's not forget where all that wealth has come from as we drink our fill in this country. If we do forget, the outlook is grim, verses 19 and 20. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. Like the nations the Lord destroyed before you, so you will be destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God. The early books of the Bible describe God as a jealous God, a God who is jealous for his own glory, a God who is jealous for his own name. And so if we dare ascribe to ourselves or to some other God that which is due to the one true God alone, if we congratulate ourselves for our success rather than seeking to give him the praise, then God is not simply just going to shrug his shoulders, hmm, oh well. They've chosen to give themselves the praise and I guess that's their choice. That's a, he's not going to do that. Rather, I mean, his response is almost unbearable to read. I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. So at the passage's end here, we're left with a bit of a quandary because we all too readily realize the arrogance that's described here in these verses we recognize it in ourselves we recognize it in others and when we see God's policy of zero tolerance in the face of such arrogance then we're left asking the question well what are we going to do God quite rightly requires humility from his people but pride is so hard to shake isn't it so hard to shake pride from our lives what can we do well, come with me for a second to our second Bible reading, Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. There Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. That's an interesting concept, isn't it? The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. Um, the fine line there, the Bible tells us that God doesn't tempt us, but he can lead us into testing situations where temptation can happen. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Jesus is in the wilderness for 40 days. That's not coincidence. He's reliving the experience of Israel who are in the desert for 40 years. And like it was for Israel, the wilderness is a place of testing for Jesus. Verse 3. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And if you read, when you read the rest of the temptation story there in Matthew chapter 4, you see that like Israel, Jesus was tempted to walk away from the path of God's choosing. If he was going to be the faithful son, he needed to... Trust God's plan. And you see that the third temptation there is the devil saying, really, throw away God's plan, worship me instead, and I'll give you all these lands, which is a lie because they, they were not the devils to give. But he's trying to move Jesus away from this path. Jesus needed to ignore the temptation 
ignore the temptation to take things into his own hands and to follow the path that his father had set down, to stick to it. He needed to ignore the temptation to work miracles for his own benefit. He needed to remember that he was taking his cues from his father. And during this interaction with the devil, Jesus shows he was successful in doing just that. During his time of testing in the wilderness, he was humble enough to know, no, it's not about me, it's about my father's plan. He was successful in doing that. When it comes to God trusting, word listening, humility, Jesus succeeds where God's people had failed in the past. Now, the good news of the Bible is that if we place our trust in Jesus, we are unified with him. Which means his humility is a humility exercised on our behalf. His trust of his father there in the desert is exercised for us. We get a share in his, in his excellence. We get a share in his ability to be the faithful son. His obedience to the Father's will becomes our obedience to the Father's will. His refusal to forge his own path becomes our refusal to forge our own path. His success in the desert becomes our success in the desert. And his empowering Holy Spirit dwells within us, which means bit by bit we can start achieving our own victories over pride. And we can start demonstrating the humility that's required of us both in times of difficulty and in times of plenty. So, may God be with us as we choose this week to exercise Christ's power in choosing humble dependence upon God. And uh, we do that in place of a knee-jerk, desperate reaction during troubled times or the arrogant trust in our own strength when times are going well. Um, Two temptations we steer clear of, rather, we seek to show humility in both those situations. And may God help us to do so. I'll lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for Deuteronomy and uh, a sharp reminder of the importance of humility in the various stages of life, in hard times to be humble enough to trust you and submit ourselves to your purposes, in good times to be humble enough to continually give you praise and thanks for what it is that you have done for us. Keep us from the pride which can be born out of despair. Keep us from the pride which can be born out of uh, the good times. We thank you for Jesus, that he is the faithful son of God. Um, So often your children have failed to to demonstrate that faithfulness, but we thank you that through our trust in him that that faithfulness is shared with us and we do thank you for your Holy Spirit too, that he is dwelling within us, helping us to make uh, wise decisions and uh, bit by bit to, uh, to be victorious over this sin of pride. So uh, through the Holy Spirit we pray you'll help us choose humility each and every time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.